It's good to be with you again today. I'm your host, Aki Ayane, born again Christian, family physician, a servant of the Most High God. Today we are going to talk about hope, the antidote for depression. Hope, the antidote for depression. Why do people who seem to have a lot to live for commit suicide? People who we look at, who, who we actually wish we had the kind of money they have, all of a sudden we hear they commit suicide. Uh, either they kill themselves with, uh, by cutting their wrist or jump uh, 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 from a high tower or um, lie on the, on the, on the, um, on the rail and uh, allow uh, trains to come over them and kill them. Why do these things happen? There was a millionaire, a billionaire actually, uh, Adolf Merkel, one of, the, one of Germany's wealthiest men who committed suicide after his family business empire began to unravel and in mountain, uh, mountain debt, he committed suicide. A billionaire whose um, global uh, empire spans U.S., Germany, one day he, 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 he thought he had nothing to live for because uh, he was losing some billions and he committed suicide. And he wasn't the only one. During the financial crisis of several years ago, that did that to themselves. Also, a, a guy called Thierry Magon de la Villehuche also committed suicide. Kirk Stevenson did the same thing. And I can name so many uh, billionaires that killed themselves around that time. Not only that, we had celebrities who have committed suicide for several reasons. Some, they may still be making a lot of money. So why do people do that? Michael Jackson overdosed on drugs. Um, um, uh, Whitney Houston overdosed on drugs. The comedian, I can't remember his name now, Robin Williams, um, killed himself, hung himself. Someone who had been making a lot of people laugh, could not laugh anymore, was sad, and killed himself. Why do these things happen? We're going to look at the key thing that is common to most people that commit suicide, depression. Depression is a major illness. In Psalm 42, verse 5, David was going through severe depression, severe hopelessness. A lot of things had happened to him. He lost his kingdom. They took his wives and children away. And he was down in the dumps. And Psalm 42, verse 5, he says this. Why are you depressed, oh my soul? Why are you upset? Wait for God. For I will again give thanks to my God for his saving intervention. I am depressed. So I will pray to you while I'm trapped here in the region of Upper Jordan. Let me give you another translation. Psalm 42, verse 5 to 6 says, Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? Why have you been disturbed within me? Hope in God. Look at that word now. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. O oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. So you see, the antidote for depression and despair is hope. Hope in God. Hope is the antidote for depression, is the antidote for despair. So, but what is this hope based on? My friend, this hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, 
says this, Praise be to the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let me say that again. He said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us, it's a gift, he given us new birth, we're born again, new birth, into a living hope, not dead theology, living hope, through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us hope and shows us that death has been conquered. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the evidence that hope defeated our final enemy, death. When the Bible says that Christ has put all things under his feet, this includes the most formidable enemy of man, death. Man has gone to different places. We've gone to the moon. We've gone to, we've, 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 we've uh, uh, created all sorts of things, airplanes, spaceships, but we haven't conquered death. It's the most formidable enemy that we have. The most formidable enemy we have is death. But if but flesh and blood like us, a man like us, conquered death, and if he can do it, then there's hope for every flesh and blood if we can anchor our soul to his finished work. His resurrection is a demonstration of victory of hope over hopelessness. Let me walk you through this, if you're a Bible scholar. A Bible scholar. In Hebrew chapter 2, verse 5 to 9, it says, It's not to the angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there's a place where someone has Testified. He said, what, if, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. And you put everything under his feet. Remember what he said. He said, you put everything under the feet of man. But in putting everything under him, God has left Nothing that is not subject to him. But you are yet present. We do not see everything subject to him. They're saying that not everything is under our feet yet. Because we're still dying. That's what this is saying. We're still dying. But we see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels. Now crowned with glory and honor. Because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God. He tasted death for everyone. He tasted death for everyone. And then he resurrected. It's the resurrection of Christ that is the evidence that man has conquered death. The last enemy, the Bible says, to be destroyed is death. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting from verse 20. It said, Now, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, and by man also came resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruit, after was those who are in Christ at his coming. Then comes to the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Verse 25. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. See that? He must reign till he has put under, all enemies under his feet. You know, he, earlier on in uh, Hebrew, he said he put everything under his, his feet, but we still not, had not yet put under, everything under him. But he, this one is saying he must put everything under his feet. Verse 26 now says, this last enemy that will be destroyed 
is death. Hear that again. The last enemy that will be destroyed is dead. For he has put all things under his feet. You see? So that, that last enemy, death, we put, we will be put under because Jesus has already done that. He has already put everything under his feet. So the answer to hopelessness is hope in the resurrection of man from the dead. And if we can hold on to that and anchor our soul, our shaky soul to that, then nothing should be able to discourage us permanently on this side of glory. So we have to now know that the resurrection of Christ is what anchors us, anchors our soul. The area of the soul is the area of the emotions, emotus, like, like moto that goes up and down, sometimes sad, sometimes happy. When I have a new car, I'm happy. When, I, when my car has a flat tire, I'm sad. It's, uh, the, our soul is like a boat that, uh, on the high seas that goes up and down, and up and down. But when a, a boat goes up and down, what do you do to it? You throw an anchor down, and you make sure that anchor is, is stuck to a, a rock, immovable rock. That anchor of our soul is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we throw that anchor through the heavenlies into the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, who is sitting at the right hand side of God, once we anchor ourselves to him, then whatever is shaking us on this side of glory cannot totally or permanently shake us. Why? Because we are anchored to the one who has conquered death. We are anchored to the rock of ages. So no matter how much we move, there's an immovable rock that keeps us going. That's Jesus Christ our forerunner, according to the order of Melchizedek. We won't go into that, but you just know that he's our forerunner who has conquered death. And because he has conquered death, and because he lives, we know we also shall live. And that death has been conquered totally and permanently. Look at what he said in Hebrew chapter 6, verse 18. He said, those who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus Christ, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So it's our forerunner. You see, in the Old Testament, they talked about the high priest. The high priest for the people of Israel is the one that goes into the Holy of Holies. And, and when he goes, he takes sacrifice with him to that Holy of Holies, and he sacrifices that animal to cover the sins of the people of Israel. The people of Israel, they have to stay outside. They have to hope that that sacrifice is accepted. How do they know their sacrifice is accepted? The only way they know is that as they, as they hear the jingling of the bell that is tied around the high priest, they know that he's not dead. And if he's not dead, he's alive. If he's alive, that means their sacrifice is being accepted. So in the same way, when we hear the jingling of our high priest, the bell around our high priest, Jesus Christ, we know he's alive. How do we know he's alive? Because when we pray in his name, someone who died 2,000 years ago, when you pray in the name of Jesus and your circumstances, your dear circumstances is shaking, something seems to come loose, ah, then you know that there is power in that name. And if there is power in that name, when you use it once, you can use it again and again and again. And that's how you go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. So, 
First Peter chapter 1 again says, we, we are born again into a new hope, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the living hope. And because we know that our hope is based on the resurrection of Christ, we keep hope alive that way. Not only that, we now flan our hope. We flan the flame of our hope. We keep it alive by expecting the return of Christ. So not only is hope based on the resurrection of Christ, it also looks forward to the return of Christ. Look at what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It said, Therefore, guard up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope completely upon the grace that is brought to you at the return of Jesus Christ. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It said, Therefore, guard up the loins of your mind, our mind again. Don't let your mind wander. Don't let your mind be discouraged. Don't let your mind be, dis be despaired. You see, so it's not only that we hope and you believe that Jesus Christ resurrected. You also have to keep on, you have to keep on finding, finding that flame of hope by fixing your heart, heart on his return. He said, fix your hope completely at the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In fact, it's not talking only about the last end times revelation alone. That's where some of us miss it. It's not just the end time revelation. It's the revelation of the word of, of, of God from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Anytime you read the word concerning something you are going through, when you are going through despair, when you are going through discouragement, and you look for an antidote in the word of God, and the word of God springs alive and then solves that problem. You read it, you believe it, you apply it, and it springs alive, and your problem is solved. That's a revelation of Jesus Christ that keeps you. It's like an appetizer that you eat before the main course. The main course is the end time return of Jesus Christ. The appetizer is what you use now when you're going through, through different circumstances of life, and you're going through certain trials and tribulations. You apply the word, you read the word concerning that circumstance, and God manifests himself. The word of God comes alive. It quickens your spirit, and you, are, you, you use it, and hope manifests. You see glory. You see, they say, you don't hope for what is already given, but you hope for something you are expecting. And as you hope for it, you look for scripture that applies to it, you you. you Apply that scripture, you read it over and over again. As you apply it and it comes to pass, you say glory. Glory, like most Bible expositors will say, is the manifested word of God. The word of God coming alive in our life is glory. Manifested word of God. In the beginning, the Bible says was the word, and the word was, with, was God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then later on in, first, uh, in, uh, in um, John chapter 1, verse 12, he said, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. So glory is the manifested Word. The Word, the eternal Word of God, the spoken Word of God, when it manifests into my circumstance, I behold the glory of God. That's glory manifested, tangible word of God. So not only is hope, uh, de de uh, is our hope dependent on the, on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we also continue to find the flame of hope by the earnest expectation and longing for the revelation of Christ from faith to faith and from glory to glory as it manifests in every area of our life. So Christ reassures us of his return by answering our prayers concerning issues in this present dispensation. That's how he reassures you that he's still alive when he answers your prayers. He reassures you of his return, that I'm coming back, by giving you appetizers to solve your problem, problems when you pray and you use his name in prayer. 
So our answered prayers are the roaring thunder that reassures us that he's coming back. Let me say that again. Our answered prayers, you see, there's a book called Incense and Thunder. When you pray, you send the incense up. An answer comes back, that's thunder. There's roaring thunder that reassures us that he is coming back. We have hope because we stand firmly on the love that God has for us. Because you have to answer, ask yourself, why do, why do, why do, why are my prayers answered? Why do, why do God, why, why does God answer my prayers? Well, because you come to Him, you believe in Him. That's why He answers your prayer. You believe in Him. You believe in His love for you. The Bible says, God so much loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's a gift from Him. He gave. He gave his son for us. You see, the, the wages of sin is death. But the gift, they say he gave his son to die for us. The gift, this indescribable gift of life, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. He so much loved us that he gave his son to die for us. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So, because we now know that he loves us and we're hoping that he's coming back for us, this hope now makes us behave like a bride that is expecting a bridegroom. You see, when a bride is expecting a bridegroom and they say the wedding is going to be at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, what does the bride do at 11 o'clock? He, he, she, she begins to prepare herself. She beautifies her face. She keeps herself pure. She keeps herself clean. She keeps herself untainted. She, she wants to look her best. I've seen going to so many weddings in which, I, in fact, years, months and weeks before the wedding, women used to come to my office and they said they want to lose weight. And I asked them, why do you want to lose weight? He said, I want to be able to fit into my wedding gown. So they, 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 they are, it makes them want to look their best. Hope. And so we are like bride, waiting for the bridegroom. We want to be pure. We want to be undefiled. So this hope for Christ motivates us to holy living. It, it motivates us to want to live right, to want to live holy. Look at what is said in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And this same grace is teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly life, lives in this present age. Why we wait for the what? The blessed hope. The blessed hope. That's the end time hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Let me say that again. It's so beautiful. He said, for the grace of God that brings salvation, the grace that saved us, is also now teaching us that you are now no more of this world. You've been asked to come out of them, come out from among them. And it's now saying, it is teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live a sober, self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the coming of the bridegroom, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify us, to clean us up for himself. It's like a bride using his word to clean us up. A people that is, are his very own, 
eager to do what is good. So hope in his coming back is what motivates us to holy living. So we want to purify ourselves and wait for him. It keeps us from having discouraging thoughts. You know, the Bible says where there is no redemptive revelation, where you don't have revelation of who you are, where you don't have revelation of your worth, where there's no vision, no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Proverbs chapter 29 it says, where there is no redemptive revelation, no vision, no sense of worthlessness, no, no sense of worthiness, people run amok, they give up, they, they, they cast off restraint. But when they have hope that there is somebody, it makes them want to keep themselves. It gets, they, make, they want to guard their mind with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. You see, because you ha they have something to hope for. They feel worthy. They feel, you see, it's like an athlete that is preparing for a race. He, he, he watches what he eats. He, he wakes up early. He disciplines himself. He, 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 he looks at what he drinks, what he eats, why, when he wakes up, and he wants to keep trim and shapeful, sh shapely to be able to win the race. Same thing when we're expecting something from God, when we're expecting the coming up back of Jesus Christ, we need to keep ourselves pure, keep ourselves undefiled. So it keeps us also from, living a, from, living, from having discouraging thoughts, you know, like we don't have vision. And it keeps us from living a careless life, like the rest of the world, whose hope are transient and shakeable. You see, when people's hope are transient and shakeable, they are careless. They don't care about themselves. And when people don't care about themselves, they run amok. They are out of control. They drink too much. They eat too much. They are slobby. They don't care about themselves. They say to themselves, let us, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. They think death is the final thing. But we know that resurrection is the ultimate thing. So we see the end of the book. We see Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth, in the book of Revelation, they say he's standing up. Standing up. He was slain, but he's now standing up. How can someone seem slain be standing up? Why? Because he's resurrected. He's resurrected. That was the same vision that Job had of Jesus Christ, resurrection. So it keeps us from having discouraging thoughts and keeps us from living a careless life like the rest of the world whose hope are transient and shakeable. It keeps us from going into depression. You see, depression is for people who are hopeless. Those who are hopeful don't get depressed. Why? Because they are hoping for something. You see, a child, when it's in school, when it's coming home, is hoping to get a meal when he gets home. So he's not depressed. He's hoping for that hot meal that his, father, his mother is going to cook. A child going to school to study, is not depressed. Why? Because he's looking at what is going, his certificate at the end of that, of that, of, of, of that uh, course. And that keeps him going. A person going to work every day for, the, for a month, what is he hoping to get? He's hoping to get a paycheck at the end of the month. So that keeps him going. So when he wakes up in the morning, even though he wants to get a little bit dis discouraged, he says, oh, I need to buy that, I need to change that tire at the end of this month. So I need to go so that I can get my paycheck. So when we have something that we are looking forward to, it will keep us, keep our hope going. We will not be depressed. And the same way for transient hope, if we are not depressed, have our ultimate hope of, of, that Jesus Christ died for you and he has totally conquered the source of all depression, the source of all despair, which is death. So every case of depression is a case of assault of the mind that has lost hope. Let me say that again. Every case of depression is a case of assault of the mind that has lost hope. And every case of depression and hopelessness is a case of an unprotected mind, unprotected head, a head that has no helmet. You know, when, they, when there was a time when people were, were struggling, were talking about not wearing a helmet to protect their head and they were having an accident and they were dying, 
So an unprotected head is an unprotected mind. Unprotected mind is an unprotected head that has no helmet. It's like a head without a helmet for protection. So we have to have a helmet on to protect our head. If you don't have something to protect your head, then you can be injured, you see? So hope is the helmet that we put on that protects our head from being crushed, from being damaged, from, from injury, you see? So that helmet of hope is what you want to put on to pr protect you from being, uh, from being assaulted or from being injured. So once you have the helmet on that, you pro that can protect your thought process, which is hope, because you have it, have it on, then uh, you, 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 your mind will not wander. Your mind will not be de depressed. Look at what is said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. It says, since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as breastplate and hope of salvation as helmet. Let me say that again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 to 9, it said, But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled. Let us be so sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. Because you know you are saved. Because you know you are permanently, permanently saved. You are now put on that hope, you see. You put on that hope of salvation. And when you put on that hope that you are saved, it will protect your mind from being discouraged. It will protect you from be being disillusioned. Anytime the disillusion wants to rear its ugly head, just say, I hope in my salvation. My hope of salvation is that Jesus Christ, I fixed my hope completely, just like first, uh, first uh, Peter chapter 1 says, he said, fix your hope completely, verse 13, on the Resurrection, revelation of Jesus Christ from the dead. He said, guard up the loins of your mind. Because you are saved by hope, you fix your hope completely on that hope that you've been saved, that hope that you are not circumscribed to all the problems of this world. You see, the problem with people of this world is they don't have anything else to look forward to. You see, they are like, like, it's like there is a brass that covers their head in the first in the in the first heavens, you know, just like 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 they can't see beyond the crowd. They, they can't see. He said, you know, the, um, Solomon used to say, "There is nothing new under the sun." People of this world they are like that. They don't believe there is anything else under this sun. They believe in Wall Street. They believe uh, in their political party. They believe in their work. They believe in it. Just some, the Bible says some trust in horses and chariots. They believe in their bank account. They believe in their checkbook. Everything they believe in is just this tangible realm. They don't believe that anything else exists. But we know that there is an intangible realm. We know that our forerunner has gone beyond this first veil, through the second veil, into the Holy of Holies, into the third heavens. And because we know that, our hope hangs in that. We've penetrated the first heavens into the second heaven through into the third heaven. Because our hope has penetrated that through the anchor of life that goes into the heavenlies, that our forerunner has gone into, our vanguard, our representative, Jesus Christ. Because we know that, because we are sure of that, because our faith is rested on that, you know, I used to read the, the story of the, the Spartans. The Spartans who believe so much. They, 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 they used to talk about the, the, the breastplate of faith and love. Breast, that breast, breastplate is like the shield of faith. That shield of faith has to be there. has to be the substance in which our hope is based on. Is they say the Spartans, when they go to war, they will rather come home dead or than come home leaving their 
shield in the war zone, in battle. It's a disgrace for his pattern, and they were known to be the best warriors ever. It's a disgrace for him to come home without his shield. It's a disgrace for him to come home without his shield. He would rather be dead with his shield still hanging on him than come home without his shield. Same way with us. We should believe in the shield of faith so much and our hope should rest on that belief. It should be the substance. Our faith in the resurrection of Jesus should be the substance of the things hoped for. Our faith that Jesus Christ died for us should be the substance, the underlying reality that he died for us. If we believe that God loved us, if we believe that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us, then it should be the substance that we hope for, for everything that we're going to hope in life. It should rest on the belief that God so loved us, that he gave his son to die for us, and that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So we need to believe in that. And we have to remind our mind on a regular basis of our unshakable hope in Christ, just like the psalmist did. Psalmist reminded himself in Psalm 42. He reminded himself in Psalm 42, verse 5, Psalm 42, verse 11, Psalm 43, verse 5. He kept telling himself, why are you weighed down? Why are you discouraged? Hope in the Lord. Why are you weighed down? Why are you dunk house? Hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. And as long as you keep on saying that to yourself, your hope in Christ and in the finished work on Calvary will be found and you will not be disillusioned. Thank God we have an anchor in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19. Just as like I said before, the people of Israel are encouraged when they hear the tinkling of the bell of the garment of their high priest when he's performing his rituals of sacrificing the lamb for their sins in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle of Moses. And as long as they hear the jingling bell, don't know their high priest is still alive. So we know that our high priest is alive anytime we mention his name or pray in his name and something shakes in the circumstances surrounding us. We know that Jesus is still alive. We maintain our hope and keep it alive by looking at the resurrected Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. He started us with, on this journey and will see us through. So you need to encourage us, uh, uh, yourself Encourage ourselves all, every day that the enemy has been conquered. Encourage yourself. Push forward to claim the victory that Jesus Christ has won for, for you. Reminding our, our, ourselves that he has put under his feet death. And we have hope that he will put him under. And as, we put our, as, we, as long as we put that hope alive, we can go from faith to faith and from glory to glory, knowing that Jesus Christ has finally conquered death. Hope has won against hopelessness. Death has been swallowed up in victory. You have to put on the garment of praise as you remind yourself. You have to praise God. Praise God all the time. Put on the garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. You see, let me end with this. What actually happens to people who are down in the dumps, who are depressed, is that there is a corresponding spirit of despair, a corresponding spirit, demon of depression, that looks for a home. And when the person has prepared his mind and they are, is garnished and is, is so much in depression and sadness, there's a corresponding demon of depression that now enters into that person and weighs them down. You see? And so when people are consistently depressed, no matter what they do, no matter if they take their Prozac, no matter if they take their, uh, their antidepressant, there's a spirit. We Christians believe that. There's a spirit that has entered. So they need deliverance. And the Bible says, whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. So what they need to do is, they call on the name of the Lord and say, deliver me from this spirit of despair. 
Deliver me from this spirit of heaviness. Deliver me from this spirit of despair. Deliver me from this spirit of discouragement. And once they call on the name of the Lord, the enemy has to run. He has to leave them. He has to run away from them. And once he has, he has run away, then now they now need to put on a garment of praise against this spirit of heaviness, not to come back. And then they now need to be renewing their mind with the word of hope, the word of God, that Jesus Christ has died for me. I do not have to be discouraged. I'm now a Bible-believing optimist. I believe that Jesus has died for me. I believe that he rose again. I believe because he died, died for me and rose again that I will resurrect. I believe that anything that I've lost, God will give me back. That the years, the palmer worm, the canker worm, the caterpillar have stolen from me, I will get them back. And when you, when you begin to quote that to yourself over and over again, your mind will be renewed. You will now have a spirit of despair. You will now have a mind that is full of depression. You will now have a mind that is full of, of discouragement. You will have a mind that is always encouraged. Encouraged in the finished work of God. Encouraged in the finished word of, 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 uh, work of Calvary. Encourage that because Jesus Christ is alive, you also will live forever in the name of Jesus. That's going to have to do it for us today. I'm your host, Aki Ayeni, born again Christian, family physician, a servant of the Most High God. Until next time, we thank you for viewing this. <music>